morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Okay, folks, good morning. We're, um, good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me all right, can you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're loud and clear. We're cold, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Um, just turn off this joke. Um, everybody's okay online, right? Uh, okay, we're starting off in closed session. This broadcasting got us in closed session. Are we in closed okay, we session? Just need to, we just uh, start. We're currently live, Chair, and we'll um, do the opening introductions, then we'll go into closed. Okay, no problem. Um, okay, I just want to remember, remind members that uh, in the meeting, can you mute, mute your microphones until you need to speak, as all background noises will be heard. And if any issues, send me a message in this uh, WhatsApp facility. Uh, the meeting will commence in closed session to consider the committee inquiry into the security at ports uh, under matter rising and to consider item 7 and 8 later in the meeting. Um, can I get confirmation from broadcasting that we are moving into closed session? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members. Um, one of those members at the committee meeting will be broadcast, uh, recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. Uh, and online. Members are, are welcome to use mobile devices so long as they're in airplane mode and muted. Uh, we have no apologies. Um, the um, the uh, chair, chairperson's business. Members may wish to note the updated committee staff and raise contact details at page 9. I want to refer members to email correspondence from the Assembly Communications Office at page 11 regarding the establishment of a youth assembly which is now open for applications with the closing date of the 21st of May. Members are asked to help promote the recruitment of the youth assembly to their young party members, uh, youth affiliated with their party and young people who reside in their local areas. This is a fantastic opportunity for our young people to have their voices heard to help inform and shape government policy and legislation and to represent young people in their area and throughout this jurisdiction. Full details, um, uh, full details uh, are contained in the correspondence from members. In terms of draft mem members, could members just mute there please because there's a wee bit of background noise coming through. Um, I want to refer members to the draft minutes from the meeting of the 6th of May. Are members okay for, with uh, the draft minutes and uh, I'll sign them off afterwards. Okay. Um, so, members, we're moving on now to item five on the agenda, and it's an oral briefing from the research. Sorry. Sorry, excuse me, Chair. Um, they were just waiting for the um, raised member staff to come, so perhaps we could move on to item six until yep. Susie joins us. Okay, members, we're just waiting for the researcher to join us, and uh, until that happens, we will just move on ahead to um, uh, agenda item number six. It's a written briefing on the EU transition update. Uh, the latest transition update is at page 123. Um, can I seek agreement to move to a monthly update from this point onwards, members? Okay. Uh, if there's any questions on the update for the department, can these be forwarded to Nick by the, the close of play today? Okay. Um, we'll move on to item number seven, Nick, or... Um, I would suggest, Chair, can we move on to um, maybe item... Number nine. Item, item nine, yes. Okay. Okay, members, uh, we'll move on to item number nine. Um, it's correspondence. Uh, it's, I want to refer members to correspondence, page 156. Uh, I want to draw members' attention to the correspondence from the Committee for the Economy at page 156 uh, regarding future meetings with the NAFRS Committee to discuss scrutiny of the protocol. The correspondence suggests that future engagements with the NA Assembly Committees and the NA Affairs Committee should be via written communication in order to enable all members to be kept informed and the discussions remain focused on scrutiny of the protocol from a committee perspective rather than uh, exchange of uh, personal views. Um, uh, are members content with this proposal? Okay. I want to refer members to an item of tabled correspondence from the Minister on the extension of the committee stage of the horse tracing trading bill uh, 2021 um, to to January 2022. Are members content to action the correspondence as suggested in the tabled index sheet? Are members content to action the correspondence as suggested in the index sheet at page 154? Okay, members okay with that? Um, 
Members, the forward work programme is at um, page 200. Sorry, for Pat's Declan, the hall. Um, tell me, did, did we ever, there was an issue around bees and the transmission or the transport of bees and their impact upon um, bees here in, in, in the north and uh, how they could transmit it. In other words, bees, non indigenous bees, and it was referred over to the department. Now, maybe I missed it or something, but we were to be, uh, the department agreed to correspond back to the, the individuals or the group concerned. Um, I don't recall seeing anything. We were supposed to be copied into it as a committee. Maybe I missed it, but I was wondering, was there any further correspondence back from the department on that? Yeah. Um, can you note that there, Nick, yes, maybe? Yes, sir. I'll follow I'll up. Chase that up with the department. All right. Thanks very much. The department, perhaps. Is that okay? That's um, good. Thank you. Um, well, well, I suppose just from Pat, the fact that Pat's is written, she, for, Nick, could, could, uh, could we... Uh, um, I noted recently that the minister has made a very welcome announcement of £3.5 million for farmers impacted um, down in the Sperrins region by the, the severe landslides a number of years ago. I wonder, could we just get a wee uh, ask for the Minister for a wee update from the Minister on that there? I'm aware that he said that the legislation would be um, in place by the summertime. So just, just get a wee update on it for, for the next meeting, if that's OK. Certainly. Members OK with that? Um, OK, members... Um, in terms of the item 10, then, is the, the, the forward work programme. Uh, it's at page 210. I will advise members that the uh, consideration of evidence on 20th May in relation to into the inquiry into the courts will need to be deferred as the issue for considerations are still ongoing. Okay. Okay, so can I seek agreement for the forward work programme? Uh, can I just yes, uh, come in there, please? Yes, Rosemary. Declan? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. In relation to the Forward Work Programme and in relation to the Climate Change Bill, I'm wondering, is it possible within the Forward Work Programme to have evidence given by an economist in relation to the Climate Change Bill? Yeah. I think no one would disagree with that. Yeah. To the Forward Work Programme, please. Yeah. I think no one would disagree with that there. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Problem, Rosemary, at all. Thank you. We can come back on that with suggestions, okay? Okay, members, um, we are going to now revert back to uh, item five on the agenda, and that's uh, a briefing from the uh, Research and Information Service. Uh, Susie, Susie Cave has, has joined us here um, this morning, um, research briefing on the climate change bill. And I want to refer members to the uh, research paper at page 26, and a copy of the, the, the Climate Change Bill and EFM at uh, page 100. And I'd like to welcome Susie here this morning. You're very welcome. Uh, so, Susie, if you want to take the opportunity to brief the committee on, on the research paper. Certainly. Um, thank you very much. I'm sorry that um, I kept you waiting. Um, it's been a while since I've been in this, um, the building. I, must have, I got lost. <laughs> but um, so apologies for that. So, yes... Um, the bill paper really just provides an overview and comparison um, and consideration of the climate change Northern Ireland Bill 2020. Now, bill papers uh, by Rays are, are produced on an impartial, objective and non-partisan basis in order to help support members' scrutiny of legislation. So really, my role here was to provide structured, independent, neutral advice and really, it starts the process of looking at the more detailed practical application of the proposals under the bill for third stage. Now, it, merely, it really pr provides just suggestions that members may want to consider when looking at the more detailed operational aspects. And most of the points raised are based on the power of comparison with other jurisdictions. And just to, re to reiterate, um, I use the same approach and process as I would with any other bill or executive bill. Now, I understand that this is a, a, a large paper. So on that basis, I'll focus really on the last section, which is section four. Now, that being said, the majority of the questions raised in the final section are based on the comparative observations in section three. And in terms of the comparison, the exact legislation from other jurisdictions is provided in section two of the paper. So really, I'm going to start 
with the table on page 38 of your packs. And this gives an overview of comparisons with the main proposals of the bill and other jurisdictions with primary climate change legislation, such as the UK, Scotland, Republic of Ireland, which is currently considering a new bill, and New Zealand and Sweden. There's more detail and commentary on these comparisons in section 3.1, but I'm just going to take you through some of those summary points. So the PMB is the only one in the table to legislate for a climate emergency. Most are declared through, primary, um, through parliamentary motions. All jurisdictions have a form of climate action plan, albeit with different contents. The CAP, or the, the climate action plan, under the PMB sets annual targets, carbon and nitrogen budgets, sectoral plans, and an adaptation programme. Now, CAPs in other jurisdictions do not set targets and budgets. These are set separately through secondary legislation. And their CAPs provide for really just um, policy actions only. Now, the PMB, Scotland and Sweden, require net zero by 2045, while the others set net zero by 2050. And this includes the Republic of Ireland. New Zealand also includes a 2050 target for biogenic methane. And this really is methane from livestock, uh, waste treatment and peatland, for example. Now, the inclusion of this was also discussed during the pre-legislative scrutiny stage of the Republic of Ireland Bill, which is currently now at second stage. The PMB and Scotland are the only ones that provide for annual targets. However, Scotland's are only for greenhouse gases and not also for biodiversity, soil and water quality, like under the PMB. In fact, none of the other jurisdictions provide for these types of targets. Most jurisdictions, apart from Sweden and Scotland, provide for five-year carbon budgets. Scotland has, a, has one long-term budget known as the Fair and Safe Budget for 2010 to 2050. And the Republic of Ireland is the only jurisdiction to provide for sector-specific carbon budgets, and these are known as sectoral emissions ceilings. Scotland is the only other to provide for a similar nitrogen budget to the PMB, and this is referred in the Scot Scottish Act as a nitrogen balance sheet and use efficiency ratio. And it lists the same sources of nitrogen to be taken account of as the, um, under the PMB, such as food production and waste, energy and transport. Now, all the other jurisdictions provide for a form of sectoral plan similar to the PMB, and these are mainly as sectoral policies under their cap. However, the ROI sectoral plans are to be in line with their binding emission ceilings for sectors. Plans under the PMB are to be made based on the principles listed in Clause 3, Section 8, and these are referred to in the EFM as just transition. However, there is no further detail as to what exactly this means and how each of these points are to be achieved in the PMB. In comparison, the Scottish Act 2009 appears to provide much more detail on the sectoral plans on the face of the Act and just transition with a definition and also refers to a just transition committee. Now, all jurisdictions provide for an adaptation programme or plan. However, not all require public bodies to report on adaptation. And this is the case under the UK Act and also uh, applies to the PMB under the UK Act requirements uh, for adaptation reporting, which follows a voluntary approach. Scotland, however, has a duty on the major players, uh, public bodies, um, and they must report. Under the PMB, reporting is carried out by the Climate Commissioner. In other jurisdictions, it's performed by government. However, the ROI requires the Advisory Council, with input from sectoral ministers, to report. And unlike the PMB, none of the other jurisdictions require a report on the review of their respective climate legislation. And the PMB requires for annual reporting on CAP, which involves a larger range of targets and budgets compared to the other jurisdictions and the UK jurisdictions and the ROI. Scotland has annual targets, but requires for reporting, and I quote, as soon as reasonably practicable after the information can be contained in the report becomes available. New Zealand is the only other jurisdiction to provide for a climate commission, similar to the Climate Change Office under the PMB. And similar to the PMB, it has monitoring and reporting responsibilities but not in relation to the review of legislation. It also provides an advisory rule. 
However, New Zealand does not provide for a climate commissioner, but a chairperson, nor does it appear to give as wide-ranging powers to its commission as the PMB gives to the Northern Ireland Commissioner, really in relation to obtaining information and performing its functions. Now, all the jurisdictions have a main form of advisory body. And across the UK jurisdictions, this is the UK Climate Change Committee, which I'll refer to as the CCC. However, the PMB lists the CCC and also the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the ROI's Climate Change Advisory Council. Under the bill, most of the advice, however, is to be given by the CCC, except in relation to the overall target. Other bodies are specifically referred to in relation to sectoral plans, such as the Single Electricity Market Committee, and in relation to the transboundary element, north-south bodies listed under Part 5 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. And like the other UK jurisdictions, the CCC is to provide annual advice and progress on targets under the cap. However, this is only for greenhouse gas and carbon and not also biodiversity, soil and water quality as required under the PMB. The PMB is the only jurisdiction with a non-regression clause. However, the UK provides for a non-regression statement under the Environment Bill to apply to all new Environment Bills. Scotland and the Republic of Ireland Bill provide for a general climate change duty on public bodies in relation to carrying out their duties on mitigation and adaptation. However, beyond the voluntary reporting on adaptation as required under the UK Act, there does not appear to be a similar duty under the PMB. So that was just a quick run through of those comparisons for now. And I'm just going to move on to section four of the paper, which is the uh, further considerations. And it starts on page 59 of your packs. As the site provides further observations and considerations, some of which may require further clarity and information. And again, these points discussed in this section have also been raised in section three and are largely based on comparisons with other jurisdictions. So the first section under this is net zero and the net zero target. And I'm just going to take you through this, um, a summary of this really. So while the PMB provides the framework for the production of CAPS, it does, however, provide for a binding overall target of net zero by 2045, which cannot be adjusted beyond 2045. It's this aspect of the PMB that potentially has the biggest impact on both positively addressing climate change and putting requirements on sectors to achieve it. Now, the need to address climate change as soon as possible and the benefits to achieving net zero has been reiterated many times through the work of the UK CCC, the IPCCC and the UNFCC. However, apart from the CCC, to date there appears to be a lack of published material and understanding of Northern Ireland's unique abilities to achieve net, to achieve net zero and the potential impacts Northern Ireland may experience from this. There appears to be a difference in opinion over whether Northern Ireland can reach net zero and when. In fact, DARA has consulted on proposals for an executive climate change bill for Northern Ireland and presents options for specific targets for Northern Ireland or targets based on the advice of the CCC. The PMB and the CCC have differing views on what is achievable for Northern Ireland with the PMB suggesting that net zero is achievable by 2045. And the latest CCC letter dated 2021 suggests at least 82% with the provision to tighten the target if there is evidence to support it. However, the letter and the previous letter dated in December 2020 also highlights the risks and difficulties for Northern Ireland trying to reach net zero by 2050 or earlier due to its unique circumstances. And some of these are listed on page 60 of your pack and also um, we're uh, discussing more detail in the net zero um, paper that I provided to the committee uh, last year. Now, to date, all jurisdictions in the UK have used the advice from the UK CCC with setting their overall net zero target. The PMB does not use the CCC's advice for its overall target. However, the CCC's advice is to be used for everything else set under the cap. So the PMB's overall zero target raises a number of questions, and these are listed on page 60. And I'll just go through some of these because I appreciate there's quite a, um, a large list. So is the overall net zero target by 2045 set without any allowance for alteration of the date going forward under clauses 3, section 9, 
and clause 11, is the overall net zero an accumulation of all listed greenhouse gases. For example, can further reductions in one gas offset fewer reductions in another? Or will there be potential for gases to be net zero individually? Will there be further detail in secondary legislation or through the CAP to explain the exact form, calculations and measurements of the overall target? And is this a binding target to which all sectors must contribute to equally or depending on their levels of emissions? Who or what body provides advice on the overall target going forward, especially should discussions for a methane or any other separate target continue down the line? And what evidence has been used in relation to the overall target on potential specific impacts on Northern Ireland and its sectors? In reaching the overall target, what consideration has been given to the impact of Northern Ireland remaining a net exporter of agricultural produce to the rest of the UK? And the ROI is legislating for net zero by 2050. What impact will this have for border areas effectively working to two different targets? So just moving on to the next section, looks at potential costs. So really, it looks at the costs of setup and the implementation to achieve targets under the bill. So the bill effectively provides for the establishment of a new climate office and commissioner and a new carbon tracking scheme. Now, while the EFM explains that it has not been possible to cost the Climate Office and Commissioner, there is no mention of cost implications for the setup of a new tracking scheme. Looking at sectoral costs, the EFM states sectoral plans will have financial implications which go beyond the immediate bill. However, the EFM also states that it is not impossible to cost these implications, and there appears to be a lack of costing specific to Northern Ireland reaching net zero by 2045 by both the PMB and the UK CCC. Now, the latest letter from the CCC provides projected costs for Northern Ireland reaching 82% by 2050. And these are listed on page 62 of your paper. However, the closest costs for Northern Ireland reaching net zero by 2045 comes as estimations by the CCC for net zero by 2050. It states that it has not been able to provide precise costs, but estimates the cost will almost certainly be higher than those of the 82% reduction target by up to 900 million per year by 2050 if engineered removals technologies are used. And it also suggests a tailwind scenario, which entails a 50% fall in meat and dairy production in Northern Ireland by 2050 and significantly greater levels of tree planting required. However, the CCC reiterates that this is not um, enough to get Northern Ireland to net zero by 2050. So again, there's some more questions just at the end of that section. I'll take you through some. Will there be more detail on the likely costs across the Northern Ireland economy and sectors for achieving net zero by 2045? In relation to the CCC tailwind projections for livestock and production, reduction for meeting net zero, by 2050, what is the worst case or headwind figures most likely to be? How will any potential negative impacts on agriculture and rural communities be dealt with? Will future agricultural and rural support and policies take account of this? And has the power, housing and infrastructure and transport sectors provided any estimations in their ability to contribute to the overall target? Do they see this as a problem, particularly if net zero by 2045 requires more stringent measures and costs compared to those provided by the UK CCC? And has the Finance Minister been consulted in relation to funding measures under the PMB? Moving on to the next section, looks at uh, consultation. So really, the importance of consultation is to help ensure buy-in and to give stakeholders the assurance that they have been involved in the early development and shaping of proposals. Now, according to the EFM, the PMB is informed by the best available science and a public opinion poll that was run in summer 2020. The EFM explains that engagement with the Climate Coalition, Northern Ireland members, and the opinion poll was the main form of consultation. However, were details of the methodologies, the range of stakeholders and responses made available. Publicly available details on the opinion poll suggest the main provision of the PMB presented was the overall net zero 2045 target. What sectors responded to the opinion poll? What percentage of different sectors contributed to that 68% agreement? What form of consultation shaped the rest of the proposals under the bill, such as the CAP and its contents, the Climate Office and Commissioner? 
and the opinion poll was conducted pre-COVID-19. Could opinions have, been, have changed since then in relation to the public's priorities for recovery or the amount of investment required to reach net zero? The next section in a similar vein looks at um, impact assessment and rural proofing. And the PMB does not appear to provide further detail to assess the specific implications of reaching net zero by 2045 in Northern Ireland. There is no form of a regulatory impact assessment, rural proofing exercise, equality screening or economic appraisal, as already discussed. So has an RIA, rural proofing and section 75 or equality screening been conducted on the PMB? Is there likely to be any disproportionate impacts based on farm size, production or area should farming practices have to change? And what does just transition mean in relation to rural areas and rural proofing? Just moving on then to the next section in relation to responsibilities and rules. Page 68 lists a number of different bodies that have been given specific rules under the PMB. From the three advisory bodies listed in relation to the climate emergency, the Executive Office in the production of the CAP, the Climate Commissioner with monitoring and annual reporting on CAP, and the, and the CCC to advise on CAP, with also the SEM Committee and the North South Bodies input on specific aspects such as the transboundary element. Have all of these bodies been informed of and agreed to their rules? And do they have the capacity, resources and expertise to perform their rules, particularly the Executive Office in relation to the production of the CAP and its contents, and the CCC in providing annual advice across the broad range of targets and budgets? Where will the EO and Climate Change Office acquire the necessary expertise? Is the expectation that expertise will come from DERA or consultants, and who will pay for this? What role does DERA have beyond obtaining advice from the north-south bodies in the transboundary element in Clause 3, Section 10? And if there are any transboundary issues identified with the CAP, who is responsible? Is it DERA for obtaining advice from the north-south bodies or the EO for the production of the CAP? And moving on just to the actual climate uh, action plan itself, the CAP is to be produced and laid by the Executive Office and approved by the Assembly. Clause 3 mentions the role of the Department in taking advice from certain bodies on the transboundary element of the CAP. Annual reports on it are to be laid before the Assembly each year and developed by the Climate Commissioner. On the basis of the annual report, the EO may make alterations to the CAP targets or measures, provided these are not lowered. Again, some of the questions which are identified then on page 70 include, what is the legal standing of the CAP? Is it to be produced through secondary legislation and resolution by the Assembly? Is the process under the PMB considered the most efficient or effective way to make amendments to annual targets, budgets, sectoral plans? For example, can specific targets be amended independently? Who will be responsible for meeting the requirements of CAP? Is it the Executive Office or DERA who will be held accountable? If requirements under the CAP are not met, could the responsible authority or body be subject to judicial review by both the OEP, or the Office for uh, Environmental Protection, and the Climate Commissioner? And will the Public Service Ombudsman also have a role, or will there be a form of agreement, or even a memorandum of understanding, to avoid possible overlap with other oversight bodies? And this is similar to the proposed operation of the OEP in Northern Ireland. Now, just looking at the scope of the targets and the budgets within it, the annual targets and budgets under the PMB go beyond just greenhouse gases to include biodiversity, soil and water quality and nitrogen budget. Under its carbon budget, the PMB provides for an annual land use and land use change greenhouse gas reduction target. And in general, detail on the budget amounts and limits is light on the face of the PMB compared to the UK Act. Just some of the questions then identified on page 71 and through to page 72 include How will new targets and budgets under this bill fit with requirements of the Water Framework Directive, the Environmental Improvement Plan or Environmental Strategy under the Environment Bill and the Nitrates Directives? In relation to nitrogen, do we have the infrastructure to monitor and obtain information required for monitoring and reporting from the different sectors mentioned, such as agriculture and food, transport, and energy. And does the EO have the expertise to take international law, the environment, 
public health and wellbeing, fiscal, economic and social circumstances into consideration in the development of annual targets. And will the EO be responsible for keeping up to date with EU developments in legislation under the protocol that might impact targets such as alien invasive species, the emissions trading scheme, fluorinated gases and ozone depleting substances? The bill explains that the transboundary element means any negative impact on the environment of Northern Ireland, including its waters and atmosphere, from activity that occurs in the ROI, Scotland, Wales and England. How will this be impacted by Northern Ireland and ROI working to different overall targets and potentially different biodiversity, soil and water quality standards and nitrogen budgets as a result of the targets under the bill? What will happen should there be negative impacts identified from activities in other jurisdictions? Will they be held accountable? Have other jurisdictions been consulted on this transboundary element? Now, moving on to the sectoral plans. A new development in the UK is the inclusion of international aviation and shipping in emission reductions. Aviation and shipping is listed as one of the sectors under the PMB. However, international aviation and shipping in Northern Ireland is a reserve matter. According to DFI, responsibility for aviation matters remains a reserve function of the Department for Transport in London and the Civil Aviation Authority. And some questions are presented on page 74, and these include, have all of the relevant public bodies in relation to the sectors listed under sectoral plans been consulted? Are they content with the provisions? Are specific ministers responsible responsible to be held accountable for delivery and implementation of sectoral plans? Will there be further guidance issued? Has Northern Ireland the confidence to legislate for sectoral plans for international shipping and aviation? Will sectoral plans take into consideration requirements of the protocol as it relates to each sector, for example, vehicle standards, energy, eco-labelling, energy efficiency of technologies, etc.? And could sectoral plans and the CAP in general be subject to oversight by the EU Commission. The next section looks at the Climate Commissioner, and the Commissioner really has two main functions. One, monitoring the implementation of the CAP and making annual reports to the Assembly, and two, to review the implementation of the Bill. Now, to perform its functions, the Climate Commissioner has been given powers to do anything in relation to its functions, including acquire or dispose of property or rights, to have access to any information or documents needed to discharge its functions. And this includes information and documents from any public body, anyone receiving a public grant or loan, anyone supplying goods or services under a contract to a Northern Ireland public body. And consideration may be needed in relation to any overlap with other similar oversight bodies, such as the regulatory role of the NIEA, the Office of Environmental Protection, once its functions extend to Northern Ireland, it could be a crossover with its oversight of environmental law, including biodiversity, climate change and non-regression. The EU Commission, in relation to the protocol and legislation under it that might impact climate emissions, such as the EETS, fluorinated gases, vehicle standards, etc. In terms of enforcement by the um, Commissioner, it appears that the Climate Office and Commissioner do not have any enforcement or sanction or fine powers under the PMB. Failure to meet targets and budgets are to be highlighted in the annual report provided by the Climate Change Commissioner with recommendations to remedy any failures. So what powers of enforcement does the Climate Commissioner have? Are they similar to the OEP, where the main mechanism is judicial review? How will any overlap with rules and rules with other oversight bodies be dealt with? In terms of the costs, of the uh, office and commissioner, the EFM does not give any specific costs for the setting up, resourcing and operation. However, the EFM explains that the commissioner will have parts similar to that of the public service ombudsman and the controller auditor general. So have any projected costs for the setup of climate change office and commissioner been conducted? Could resourcing costs, salaries and staffing be similar to the Northern Ireland ombudsman and the controller auditor general? or even existing commissions in Northern Ireland, such as human rights, equality, children and young people. In terms of salary, this is to come from the Consolidated Fund. Have discussions been had with the Finance Minister in this respect? Moving on then just to the next section. We're getting near to the end. Uh, page 77 
gives examples of the different advisory rules under the PMB. And this is from the three relevant advisory bodies in relation to the climate emergency, advice from the CCC on the CAP, and the other specific bodies, such as the SEM committee and the north-south bodies. Does the CCC give advice on all contents of the CAP, including the overall net zero target going forward? Does the CCC have the capacity and expertise to advise annually on the range of targets and budgets under the PMB, in comparison to its advisory rules with other UK jurisdictions? Have all bodies listed been informed of and agreed to their rule? And what happens if any of the bodies do not or cannot assume their role in giving advice? And then the final section really just looks at some of the terminologies um, used throughout the bill. And some of which may require further detail or definition. And just by example, uh, just transition, which compared to the Scottish Act, there's no definition on the face of the bill. Uh, and it appears vague in terms of exactly what the list provided in Clause 3 8 means and how each could be achieved. In fact, Scottish legislation provides for a just transition committee to provide advice on the measures. So, really, I appreciate that there were more questions here raised than answers in this paper, but I hope that really they will help members with starting to review the practical application of the proposals. Thank you. Um. That's great, uh, Susie, and that, that's a fantastic, incredible piece of work, isn't it? A 90 page document that you um, compiled for us, and it has made a huge contribution for us, uh, our, our beginning to um, scrutinise this, this huge piece of, of, of legislation. Um, I suppose, Susie, what, what's one, one of the things that um, I'm try, trying to get my, my head around is, you know, the the whole issue of uh, sequestration. I know, I know, I know. There's there's different views on the climate change bill and targets and all that there. But I think one of the things that uh, farmers um, have been raising is that the getting appropriate credit for their sequestration. You know, we talk about um, net zero. You know, um, where we balance out the farmers can balance out um, the, what the the emissions are produced with what they sequester or absorb. See in your um, in your research around this subject, Susie, have um, have you explored or have you come across any uh, mechanisms, uh, either nationally or certainly internationally, whereby there there is um, a mechanism uh, whereby this can be accurately um, calculated in order for farmers to work out what their baseline is. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Um, it is an important aspect because I know that. The uh, Climate Change Committee has talked about some of the, the, the difficulties that Northern Ireland faces in terms of sequestration and even um, in, in terms of looking at its contribution that is already existing as well yeah. um, in terms of our, our grassland. Um, and looking actually, there's been quite a lot of work done by uh, Chagask, in terms of looking at from an agricultural perspective and, um, and food production, and they have produced um, what they they call sort of you know project projections and on how farmers can go about trying to um, improve their you know uh, climate change efficiency um, sort of procedures and one of the elements that they focus on is this idea of uh, sequestration. Now I have looked at it very briefly <laughs> um, and I would not want to start going into a lot of detail on it now but I know that that does exist and would be a good source for me to to look at yeah. going forward. Yeah. I think that would be crucial because obviously the, the message is, there's, you know, there, farmers are Farmers are getting anxious at, at the message coming out that the only way to um, reduce the emissions is to cut their livestock, but that's not necessarily what Chagask are saying, um, and because they have produced their marginal abatement cost curve yes. action plan, uh, so it'd be useful just to explore that there in more detail, and and also Susie, you know again without prejudice, what would be your assessment of you know a situation whereby the north and south uh, would have different targets because 
I'm conscious that um, across the island, there's a £1.3 billion industry, agri-food industry across the island of Ireland, and the overwhelming majority of our agri-food products are what might be deemed mixed origin because we export so many sheep and we import so many pigs and, and there's, I think it's around 70,000 cattle were imported during the last year, for example. So what would be your assessment or um, of you know if the, both parts of the island uh, had different targets? Well, in terms of the sort of the impacts on specific um, agricultural production and uh, that sort of thing, um, I would not want to go into uh, much discussion on that. That's yeah. as you know that that's not really my yeah, area. Yeah, but exactly. yeah, in terms of the, the targets and the difficulties mm. of implementation, working to two different um, frameworks. I mean, um, I know that you know, especially in sort of more border regions, yeah. and you effectively have um, farms that span across the border. And it does bring complications for that, not just for the implementation, but obviously um, for the regulatory role as well. Mm. And obviously the, the protocol um, helps to keep us in some way sort of bind with, bind. Yeah, with um, down south as well. But there are certain aspects under this bill that aren't provided under the protocol, so the likes of biodiversity, the nitrogen budget, the fact that we mm. have one and they don't. Um, I suppose another uh, difficulty as well in, in relation to it is looking at the uh, our sectoral plans are, as well are, are going to be based mainly on policies um, and policy actions. Uh, down south, theirs are based on um, binding sectoral emission targets. And I think that they're projecting um, a large improvement in terms of their overall agricultural emissions because of those binding targets. So yeah, you know there, there will be differences. It's um, that's where you know trying to tease out the the crossover between the regulatory rules as well. So the likes of the Office for Environmental Protection, where the EU Commission might come um, involved as well. But then the transboundary element too, because you know it, it's looking at the impacts on Northern Ireland from these other. Um, regions and obviously the ROI is classed as one of those and if they're if they're effectively working to different standards than us you know what impact will that have then on us as well and regulation. Thank you Susie. Um, I'm going to um, move around the room. Um, John you you have indicated you want to speak? John Blair. There, yeah, thank you, and Susie, thank you uh, for another detailed um, and, and very useful report. Uh, Chair, uh, the, the two main questions really for, for me are, um, first of all, broadly, uh, what uh, in research available can, can, can show how up-to-date that information is, particularly on a, a cross-sectoral basis? I regularly point out that um, whilst there is, for very understandable reasons, um, a huge concentration on, on agriculture in the Northern Ireland climate change context, um, often, uh, again, in my opinion, there isn't enough attention paid to the fact that other sectors are not that far behind agriculture in their contribution to greenhouse gases. Transport, for example, at 23% against agriculture 27 or if you take energy and business together, they equal agriculture 27%. So I'm keen to know what um, improvements that are being made in the various sectors are, are taken into consideration and how up to date that information is in, in a picture that is changing all the time and where the situation might be getting better, albeit only slightly better in some instances. The second question is um, in relation to, to the detail available to, to Susie and other researchers, because there's information available quite recently that the UK Climate Change Committee has said that uh, its own sixth carbon budget report did not take into um, account, for example, the greenhouse gas impacts of less, less intensive farming or, I agree, ecology, because they, they are harder apparently to, to assess. And um, I, think, I think they quoted, I'm quoting here, due to lack of robust evidence um, on the abatement potential does that mean, therefore, that some of the information available, even from the Climate Change Committee, could be an underestimate of what has been achieved in the agriculture sector in Northern Ireland currently? 
Um, thanks, John. I'll just I'll try and address the the first one. I'm not sure um, if it's something that can be directed um, specifically at me, but uh, maybe yeah. you know as as we progress uh, through considering the bill. Um, in terms of the other sectors and you know uh, work that's ongoing there, um, I explored it in the last it was the paper on net zero. Um, it, that I think it was earlier on in this year actually that I provided that paper and it just sort of covered some of the, the main programmes that are effectively um, being implemented at the moment. But what I did um, notice is that we're really at a, a large, we're at a, a significant change of transition really at the minute um, off the back of Brexit and a lot of programmes coming to the end of their term. So a lot of these are, are being developed. Um, the green growth uh, strategy, for instance, is you know, sort of listed as one of the, the main ones um, and to try and effectively work across all sectors. And um, so we're at that stage where, yes, um, it would be interesting to know what some of those policy developments will be and how they will um, link in with this um, climate change bill. Especially, you know, going across the range of targets that are, are provided under it. Um, in relation to your second one and the research that's available, yes, um, John, I appreciate the fact that it, it really is at the stage where new developments are coming through. We've had very little to go off from the beginning, and um, I suppose the, the CCC has been the main um, body that has been referred to by all jurisdictions and I appreciate what you're saying about the the sixth carbon budget um, it's something that I had heard about I haven't had a chance to look into that into an awful lot of detail as yet but again that's something in terms of the modeling that's been used um, that would be worth looking at I suppose just at the yeah. moment the only real published material that um, myself and any other researchers can re really refer to is, is the work on the Climate Change Committee, but I'm hoping that with the generation of this bill, um, other things will, will be developed from that. So. Yeah, so, so thank you, Susie. I should clarify that I didn't expect you to have all of the detailed up in your information across all of the sectors, uh, and believe me, I didn't, but I suppose that the question I was posing really is, is there a, an ever-changing picture that we need to keep revisiting as, as we move through and, and that's really where it was coming from all yeah, yeah no very much there is and you know that's also one of the 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 areas um you know for looking at the responsibilities in terms of the executive office you know it, it's a big undertaking to not only uh, produce the, the the caps but also as you say look at the ongoing developments across all the different sectors that we're expecting to come forward now so yeah thank you for that Okay, John. William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, uh, again, our de detailed uh, briefing. Uh, I see, uh, and uh, I think it's important to look at, uh, that all jurisdictions in the UK have taken the advice of the Climate Change Committee when setting their overall zero, net zero targets. Um, the Climate Change Committee would be seen as the experts in this. I would have took expert advice, I presume, in this, wouldn't I? Well, very much so. That's how they're, they're described, yeah, um, across all the, the other jurisdictions in their formation of um, legislation. Yeah, well, given that's the case and given the importance of the agri-food sector to Northern Ireland's economy, uh, would it, do you believe that I know it's difficult for you, maybe, to say. Would you see where well, you see this? But would it not be wise for us to take on board the climate change committee's advice? I mean, again, it's not for me to to say, as as, as you rightly say. Um, in terms of myself, with the paper, I've had to refer to what's publicly available, and so on that basis, um, a lot of my paper has to be based on the Climate Change Committee's um, information. Now, should other information come to light and maybe, you know, could it have come through um, research attached to this bill in the generation of it or um, through um, 
through other consultation, then I could have referred to that as well. But because nothing was really publicly available yet, the, the main one that I had to refer to then was the, the Climate Change Committee. Yeah, but all other regions of the UK have obviously taken on board the Climate Change Committee's findings. They've all adopted, yeah, their, their targets yeah. are all based on the Climate Change Committee. Yeah, that's okay, so thank you. Thank you, William. Harry? All right. Yep, okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Sue. Good to see you again. I wonder, could you tell me where else in the world, Sue, or what other country has as tight a bill as this? Have you been able to make any uh, comparisons and give us an example of where? I think we'll need something simpler, you know, something a lot simpler in every way. As the Minister of Light Land has built and even uh, recommended by the CCC, even like to me, even in the overall picture, this bill and this form is not good for anyone that I can see. It would be creating rural poverty and um, even our agri food sector would be seriously penalised. But I just wonder if you could tell me if there's any other country with this tight a bill, basically. That'll be my question. Thank you. With this tight a bill in terms of the, the overall target? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, well, the paper um, refers to um, obviously Scotland and Sweden, who also have a 2045 um, target. Now, uh, other uh, countries explored in the paper are New Zealand as well. Um, and New Zealand, as you well know, and have probably um, talked about it in many meetings and their agricultural sector and the importance of it. Um, and theirs is for 2050 and then obviously down south as well. And their emissions have been quite um, likened to, to ours in terms of their emissions profile, although I do believe that they are struggling a bit more in terms of making reductions from their agriculture sector than we are. This is on here on the sale, maybe others can hear you, but I didn't get much of the that. Are the rest of the members able to hear? Um, sorry, Harry. M members, if you're not speaking, could you you mute this? May well that may well have interfered. I can hear Susie very well because she's sitting beside me. <laughs> so, so I have no complaints. But um, uh, if members want to just mute the microphones if they're not speaking, uh, because the interference may well be impacting um, the audio from Susie. So it was the end of Susie's uh, contribution there. The last contribution, Harry, that you didn't pick up. Is that right? Possible, just try it once the last few sentences or whatever, Chair. I appreciate that. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, let um, say uh, down south, um, they have their 2050 target. Obviously, it's not 2045, but I do understand that for them, it's um, quite a target for them to make uh, based on their emissions profile. So uh, while it's been described as quite similar to ours, they, they've definitely struggled a bit more in making those reductions um, from agriculture. Uh, uh, compared to compared to ourselves, um, looking at other countries, I mean that's something I can look into. Um, I know uh, the likes of um, the Netherlands and um, with their sort of very flat based land, you know that that could be another area. But unfortunately, due to time constraints, I just didn't have a chance to look into an awful lot. But as I say, there's some there provided with 2045 targets as well. And the details in, in there's more detail in the paper. Okay, thank you, Harry. Um, Rosemary, over now to Fermanagh. Thank you, thank you um, Declan. Uh, can I just say I had great difficulty there hearing you also, Susie. There seems to be terrible interference in the background when you were replying to Harry. I just want to go back to this uh, net zero by 2045 that's in the bill. How can I, can I ask how binding that is? Can that be changed when I'm, I've if amendments are put in, or is it there to stay? 
Well, going by the detail on the bill, and Rosemary, just checking, can you hear me? Okay. I can, Susan. And just to say thank you very much for your detailed, detailed breakdown of everything. It's just very interesting to read. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, yes, so um, I'm just trying to remember now my train of thought. <laughs> can you repeat what you just asked? Yes. Yeah, I said that. How, legal, how binding can amendments be made to the 2045 date that appears for net zero carbon? Right, yes. So the, the overall, yes, target. Um, yeah. The clauses in the bill, um, the detail within it, suggests that this target cannot be altered um, to be moved beyond 2045. Um, and that would be any amendments or changes would be made by the executive office um, and through approval by the assembly. Unfortunately, we don't know what that sort of form or you know resolution would be provided. Um, the overall target is to be provided under the cap, but we don't know what form of um, if it's if the cap's being produced through secondary legislation, and again, what form of resolution is afforded to it by the assembly. But um, as far as a binding target, and uh, it cannot be pushed back. The gases, however, that it applies to um, can be added to on the list, on the face of the bill, by DERA. So there's a bit of a, a two rules coming in with any um, changes or amendments to the overall target, but effectively the, the target date can't be moved back or standards can't be lowered in any way. Yeah, and that's legally binding and no amendment can change it. Not to push it back or lower standards. Back, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Claire? Claire? Claire, it's your... I can't hear you, Claire. Is your... Are you muted? Hello, yeah, hello. Yeah, I can hear you now, Claire. Okay, sorry, don't know what was going on. I'm looking pixelated again as well. Yeah. But and thanks, Susie. Another great report, and thank you so much for it, as always. I'm going to ask you, have it, when you were doing research on this, did you find anywhere where there was assessments carried out for, so in the CCC report, Northern Ireland's recommended for at least 82% reduction, is there, and this is based on the UK model of net zero. So has there been any work or papers or assessments done that you've found of who would who within the rest of GB would pick up the slack of us not being net zero? So if we're 18% less, who's able to go further than net zero in England, Scotland or Wales to pick that up? Um, yes, Claire, I mean, um... It's my understanding from, as you, as you rightly say, the, the CCC's reports that um, effectively different areas within the UK can help to offset the 82% the that we would be effectively um, working towards. Now, each of the different areas within the UK can um, have a, a, um, a particular area that they can focus on. Um, I mean, in relation to Scotland, it's uh, sequestration is quite a, a big area for them and um, we've seen their renewable energy uptake as well uh, but off the top of my head that, that um, I, I wouldn't want to go into an awful lot of detail on that I can look at that in in more detail for you I think that would be a useful one just to see where and uh, what sectors really um, from each of the different jurisdictions will be um, contributing most to to that um, difference. Yeah, no, that's great. And then it's sort of the same thing, but applying it to this transboundary um, issue that we would have in Northern Ireland. So if we in Northern Ireland are not net zero, so we know that the, in the ROI, they're 
proposed bill that's working its way through is looking at net zero as well. So if we're looking at Scotland, England, Wales and the Republic of Ireland all heading for net zero and Northern Ireland not getting there, you know, in terms of, so if we can get England, Scotland or Wales to pick up the 18% that we would be missing, um, how does that impact then if the Republic would be net zero? And is there anything been done on that that you've come across yet? Um, again, that's been quite a specific area of the bill. Um, and so I haven't really had a chance to go into an awful lot of detail on that yet. But, you know, throughout the duration of the, the third stage here, certainly we can look at those areas. Um, obviously, you know, the, the transboundary element that you're referring to is looking at, you know, the 2045 overall target, which would neatly, you know, fits in with um, Scotland and then the other areas, uh, the rest of the UK and Republic of Ireland would be 2050. So the trans the transboundary element really would depend on that overall target and how well it would fit in with uh, with the rest. But I suppose you know with us being completely bordered with um, Republic of Ireland, that's going to be the biggest sort of differences that would be wanting to look at as well. But I understand that emissions in general throughout the UK have to contribute to the overall net zero target if that ends up being the proportionate approach taken. Grand. Thanks. I have many other questions, but I'll go through your report in more detail and maybe follow up with you. But thank you so much for that. Yeah. Right, sir. Uh, Philip? Uh, th thank you very much. Um, just, just like everybody else, uh, Susie, I want to thank you for your paper. It's, I mean, it's going to be uh, really, really useful to the committee uh, as we go forward. Uh, and I mean, the, the ongoing work that you do, I'm sure, will be, be useful. So, I mean, I, I don't really have a pile of questions for yourself. Just one in relation to the duty on public bodies in the bills, I think you said in Scotland and, and, and the South. Uh, and not here. So maybe, maybe just a wee bit more of an explanation of what that means and the impact of it not being in uh, this bill. And then just uh, because I know some of my colleagues in, in the Assembly raised the issue of the definition of uh, just transition not being in this bill. So I sense the differences of that not being defined clearly uh, in our bill in comparison to other bills? Surely. Um, so the first one really on the, the duty on, on public bodies. So um, really what I've looked to here is the Scottish Act 2009. Um, so basically there's a general duty placed on public bodies in relation to delivering their targets, so mitigation measures and um, then delivering their adaptation programme. Um, so it also requires, there's a, there's a duty on what, the, what it classes the major players as well to report on the measures that they use both in terms of mitigation and adaptation. Now the UK Act doesn't have the same sort of uh, general duty either, but um, in terms of reporting, from public bodies, it's more of a voluntary approach, so it doesn't put an actual duty on it. So effectively, if we are applying our adaptation programme as it is under the UK Act, you know, again, that's that question, is that then based on a voluntary approach um, because it's under the UK Act? So there would need to be something specifically mentioned within the bill to place a, an actual duty on public bodies bodies to report and respond on their functions under the bill as they do then in Scotland. Um, uh, just sorry, before we move on to the next one, in terms of the major players, I mean, uh, who, who are the major players? Yes, I shall just um, turn that up. Yeah, so major players, um, the major players actually aren't on the face of the, the Scottish Act. Um, it, it comes in accompanying guidance. So the guidance considers the major players to be bodies with large estates and or staff numbers, high impact and influence, large expenditure, or an auditing or regulatory function, and suggests that these bodies should be ambitious in their action on climate change and seek to do more than others. So that's the wording from their guidance document. And I suppose you know, that's where um, some of the questions in relation to further detail under the bill here as well, will that be provided in, um, 
guidance similar to this major players under the Scottish Act or effectively written into secondary legislation. Now Scotland itself does have a lot more detail on um, the cap as well and what comes under it. I mean their climate action plan, a lot of the objectives under the climate action plan in Scotland are actually on the face of the bill as well. So it's just you know those sort of differences in, in, in detail and whether that will then effectively come through secondary legislation or through guidance. And as you well know, guidance, well, it's, it's, you know, it is what it says. It's, it's guidance, so there's a bit more <laughs> flexibility. So, yeah. Okay. okay. And then just, uh, just to repeat, you know, maybe give an assessment of the strength that the just transition principles contained in our bill in comparison to the others. Yes, yes. So uh, the just um, transition principles... Yes, they're, they're quite similar to those that are listed in the, the Scottish Act. However, um, the Scottish Act does um, explicitly define what just transition is on the, the face of the bill and makes that connection and makes that link. So I suppose for people applying it and people looking at the bill, they then can see where those principles that are listed are coming from. So under the, um, the Scottish Act... The, the definition is used for just transition as reducing emissions in a way which tackles inequality and promotes fair work at the heart of Scotland's approach to reaching net zero. So again, it's just whether something like that would want to be explicitly defined on the face of the bill, um, as opposed to just in the explanatory memorandum, where um, you know, and, and to make that connection. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Susie. Okay. Um, before, uh, just Rosemary, come back in, in here again. But see, just before I go back into Rose, round to Rosemary again, Susie, I just want to just elaborate on one, one issue that actually, actually Rosemary ra raised. It's relation to um, the bill itself. I, I know that there's, there is a, a, a debate going on around the separate measure for methane, for example, and also um, it was even suggested the, in the chamber debate there, I think it was actually... Perhaps Steve Aiken mentioned it about you know possibility of looking at the amendment to make it 2050. So, see the fact that this is this is an act of this assembly. Surely all aspects of the bill could be um, amended if that was the case. Would that not be right? I mean, that's something that um, I was thinking you know need further clarity on because mm. because a lot of the targets are grouped together under mm. this one climate action yeah. plan, and I couldn't find really any of the other jurisdictions that provided those binding targets. Now, mm -hmm. I know the Republic of Ireland does refer to the binding um, emission ceilings mm -hmm. in relation to their sectoral plans yeah. under their climate action plan. Mm -hmm. But those are developed separately through you know, secondary legislation and then referred to within the, mm -hmm. the cap. So we are quite, this is quite unique in that um, instance. And uh, just from, from the detail of the bill, I just I couldn't ascertain whether the cap itself and all of those targets mm -hmm. under it will come in one lump sum under mm -hmm. secondary legislation or effectively separately um, mm -hmm. each target, because you know in terms of um, making changes or amendments, yeah. can you make it to the individual targets, um, mm -hmm. or will it have to be looking at the, the cap in general? Yeah, um, but certainly it would be within the, the the power of the assembly to do that. Um, yes. Well, the, yeah. The the, uh, the the bill gives the amendments uh, powers to the executive office, um, and in relation to the majority of the cap, so the annual targets and that sort of thing, um, those would be based on the climate change committee's um, annual, or the commissioner's sorry, the commissioner's annual report, um, and then those would go forward to the executive office, who lay any uh, changes then in front of the assembly. Rosemary? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Rosemary, loud and clear. Yeah, yeah. it's just in relation... To, I yeah. was a bit concerned in relation to... You said that there had been no rural proofing. Am I... Was I correct in reading that? That's, of this bill? That's right, Rosemary. Yeah, as far um, as the detail go, um, that's been presented... Um, the, that's been be no rural proof. Well, would it be useful? Would it be useful to perhaps have rural proofing considered for this bill then? 
given that, given the perhaps the potential impact on the rural community? Certainly, I mean, um, in terms of best practice, Rosemary. Um, now, in terms of the actual guidance that's given for the generation of, of private member bills, I would, you know, like to look at that in a little bit more detail. I'm not sure that it's an actual requirement under private member bill guidance um, to to produce one. But in terms of best practice, um, and I know that you know. One of the main comparisons I can make really is to any executive bills that have been presented before us and uh, a rural um, proofing exercise you know, would be conducted and even just to see how it um, applies to the Rural Needs Act as well in um, 2016. So again, yes, certainly I think that's something going forward that would need to be explored. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Susie, just for clarification, do you see the, the CAPs, will, will, am I right in saying that they will have to be subject to rural inequality proofing? Um, yes, because they're effectively, they're bringing in the, the, main, the, the annual targets, the budgets, the sectoral plans, so they will all come in under that scope of the, the, the CAP. So yes, um, the bill does um, say that any CAP will go out for consultation. Mm. Um, and would that um, include rural proof and under the Rural Needs Act and the yeah. EQAA? It doesn't mention um, the rural proofing exactly or um, assessments, so that's maybe something that could be looked at to see um, yeah. if that maybe would need tightened up to ensure mm. that rural proofing, um, as, as Rosemary rightly said, you know the, the impacts that mm. could be faced by rural communities as well. Um, quality is um, section 75 as well you know if, if we look at the demographic of the majority of our sort of you know farming uh, sector um, and any changes that would be brought into their practices you know that's bound to have an impact on them and um, their livelihoods so. perfect <laughs> that Rosemary thank you and Susie as well Morris Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me all right? Yes, Morris, loud and clear. I'd like to thank you, Susie, for a very detailed and informative research paper, uh, and it will be a valuable reference paper uh, as we move forward to, uh, to to discuss this bill or any other climate change bill that may come. But uh, can I ask, uh, Suzanne, the aviation and shipping has been mentioned, uh, and the impacts of, of that is, is unknown. But what about the unknown impact uh, around intensive farming, I'm talking about the importation of grains and feeds and, and, and the general surplus of manure, methane, gas, etc. In comparison to normal farming practices, I think we need to draw a, a distinction between what is normal farming practices and what is intensive farming practices and the impact that that has on climate change. And, and can I ask, or maybe you can't answer, but I'll ask anyway, should we be looking and seeking a closer alignment with what is happening across the UK and the Republic of Ireland? as this bill evolves, and should we put more emphasis on expert consideration in preference to the outworking of an opinion poll? Uh, do we need to carry out major research on the rural economy and employment, as, as Rosemary ha or has alluded to there just a few minutes ago, and the chairman? Thanks, Morris. Um, I'll certainly try and address some of those, and if I can remember the, the, the list. Um, in terms of um, exploring further areas, certainly, um, we, I could not find any specific costings related to the bill. Um, so in terms of bringing on expert um, advice from an economic perspective, um, certainly I think that would be useful in helping you to determine what, um, you know, in terms of not just the achieving the targets and the implementation of proposals for across all the different sectors, but also the setup costs then that will be faced with um, the likes of the commissioner and um, new tracking scheme. I mean, the new uh, tracking scheme under the bill that's proposed to come in under carbon budgets, um, there's very little detail on it in relation to um, whether it could be, it could form from an existing scheme um, as it has under the Scottish Act actually provides for that. So, um, or also costs 
how they could be recovered. Mm -hmm. So in Scotland, the costs of, of a tracking scheme can be recovered through fees from the members under that scheme. So it's you know, things, things like that. Um, in terms of the agricultural practices and intensification, um, again, I, I, it, it's not my area of specialty, um, but uh, again, something that um, could look into. And as I'd said to uh, Declan before, um, uh, Chagask have done quite a lot of, of work on that, but it would be good to get something. Wild comparisons are, are good, as you rightly said, looking across what other parts of the UK are doing. We have to understand that Northern Ireland is quite unique um, and different. And even while our emissions uh, profile is very similar to the Republic of Ireland, we're at a different starting point as well from, from them. So, um, but yes, that's, that's something that should be explored. Thanks very much. Okay, Mars. Okay, Mars. Yeah. Thank you, Mars. Patsy. Yeah, Thanks very much indeed. Um, first of all, I'd like to compliment Susie on her hard work there and uh, raising a lot of questions that I'm sure uh, a number of stakeholders, if they haven't positioned themselves on them, will, will want to be raising them with us as a committee as we work our way through this climate change bill. Um, uh, that, so that's a compliment to you, Susie. And I noticed a number of times there you've referred to Chagask. Um, Chair, are we likely to be taking evidence? I'm not quite sure. Are we likely to be taking evidence from the likes of Chagask? Uh, because it'd be very important, given that while in terms of, um, as Susie said, we're, we're maybe at slightly different stages of uh, development in regard to climate change legislation, there is a huge crossover and indeed ownership of um, firms and production outlets in the north here and likewise in the south of common ownership and uh, every day as we know uh, there's there's exchange and transfer of goods and milk and cheese and all those things across the border on, on an all-island basis so um, are we likely to be having that element of input to make sure that what we're doing and what we're suggesting to do is at least harmonising with the efforts that have been done. And there might be even ideas coming to us uh, from the Republic. Well, um, for what it's worth, I, I have requested Chagas to be included as uh, a key stakeholder, Patsy, as we move forward to scrutiny of this. Um, and you're right in what you're saying. You know, we, we exported 100 million litres of milk a year to the south of Ireland, you know, and there's a lot of beef and lamb goes both ways as well, and indeed your own constituency mm -hmm. in Ulster, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pigs as goes mm -hmm. into, into your own constituency there. So I think it's absolutely crucial that we hear from the likes of Chagas who 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 have who actually have developed an action plan to assist farmers um, reduce their emissions uh, and and move towards uh, carbon neutral. Is there anything you want to add, Nick, to that? Chair, just to confirm, Chagas have been um, they're included on the invitation list to provide oral evidence to the committee in the yeah. weeks ahead. So they've been yes, Nick just confirmed there, Patsy. They've been invited to provide oral evidence to the committee in the weeks ahead. So obviously, hopefully, they'll accept that invitation. I mean, um, obviously, invest in I um, because what what I'm picking up is there's quite a considerable bit of of. Uh, work and indeed interest being done at the moment between um, Invest NI and picking up on potential opportunities for the North and we want to make sure that that's all done in a safe and uh, forward planning uh, basis. So th that'll be great. Thank you for that, Chair. Hey, Patsy. Uh, Claire, you're looking in there. Hi, thanks, Chair. I'll just make a quick follow-up on that. Um, have we have we got the food and farming food farming and countryside commission on our list for evidence? Do we know? I haven't got it in front of me. Apologies. If they're not, we can put them on. That'd be uh, fair to say. Uh, Clara, I don't have the list just in front of me. I will check that after the meeting and confirm. And if not, we will add them to the list. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Claire. Um. Okay then. Okay, members. Um. Okay, members, I want to just then uh, conclude uh, again. Susie, that, that is an amazing piece of work you've done for us. Um, very helpful, very thought-provoking, and it's just the sort of 
thought-provoking document we need as we begin this scrutiny process to try and tailor make uh, an appropriate uh, climate, uh, um, climate, climate change bill here for the north. So I want to just thank you for coming here this morning. Good to Good to see you back again. It's been online for the last year or so. Hello. It's yeah. good to see you back here in person again. So thank you, Susie. Thank you. And take care now. Okay, members. Um, members, we're going to stay in closed session then, okay, where we go to item seven on the agenda. Allen Assembly Committee Room 30. Um, we're live now. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Members, um, we're now at the final uh, item of the agenda. If there's any other particular business the members want to raise before we conclude this, um, we just moved into the afternoon now. Okay. Okay. Thank you, members. Okay, the next didn't have the next meeting. The next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 20th of May, at 10 a.m., and it will be a hybrid meeting as. Uh, uh, as stream, streamlined on the assembly website. So thank you very much for your indulgence and I'm going to adjourn the meeting now. Thank you, folks. Take care. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.